When you look at a waterproof surface, the lotus leaf might not be the first thing on your mind. But if you were to watch rain fall on that leaf, you would see the drops beat up and roll right off. And you would be marveling at its super hydrophobicity or extreme water repellent abilities. Your naked eye couldn't see this the complex micro and nano structure that lets the water sit on top of the surface and stream off. But it's this beautifully complex natural design that is helping researchers understand and capture that capability. In fact, the discovery of this lotus effect led to the development of waterproof paints and coatings, even self cleaning surfaces. Bio inspiration is the process of looking to nature for new innovation. And it might have touched your life already without you even realizing it. Before you could tie your own shoes, you may have had reason to thank the burdock plant, the sticking abilities of its burrs based on tiny hooks at the tip of each needle led to the invention of Velcro. And if you've ever ridden a high speed train, perhaps you forgot to thank the kingfisher. This bird's amazingly streamlined beak helps it glide into the water without a splash. Copying this design helped engineers figure out how to keep the train from creating a dangerously loud boom while rocketing into a tunnel at 200 miles an hour. And more bio inspired technology is in the works today. Tiny computer fans and giant wind turbines may be improved in efficiency by incorporating bumps on their edges, copied after those found on the edge of a whale's fin. And studying the unique surfaces on the bodies of beetles that live in the Namibian desert may help us learn how to harvest water from fog. The possibilities are as diverse as the patterns you see in nature, because bioinspiration is a process, a broad way of looking at things. It's not constrained to one area of application. You could apply it to advances in medicine, alternative energies, developing new materials. The potential is limitless. But a key factor in realizing that potential is the amount of sources that we draw inspiration from. We limit ourselves if we look to only a few model organisms. Studying the lotus leaf led to a prolific development of materials with waterproof capabilities. But the next burst of innovation didn't occur until researchers broadened their view to look at the pitcher plant as well. Adding just one more model organism caused a burst of innovation and new solutions to solving that water repellent problem. There's now over 1,600 studies and over 20 startup companies born out of these biological blueprints. All that from just two biological models. But nature has a massive design bank to choose from. Evolution has provided us with a diverse array of adaptations and a wide landscape of models to choose from. Studying this biodiversity, the variety of life on this planet at all its levels, is the best way to unlock nature's design potential. But how do we access these blueprints? With over 1.7 million species identified on Earth, how can engineers make sense of this complex web of life? And how can they sample its information? What if there were carefully curated collections documenting all life we have discovered on Earth so far and their evolutionary connections? Right, natural history museums. These institutions offer massive catalogs of nature's diverse forms, both around today and extinct. Most of the collections housed by museums are actually too enormous to display on public view, and over 90% of the specimens they hold may be preserved behind the scenes. This provides an incredible resource for researchers doing all kinds of work. Here I am combing the collections of the Bishop Museum in Hawaii to look at a rare specimen of monk seal. Now, these samples are helping me understand how seals have evolved an advanced system of underwater touch and how they can use their whiskers to track the minute trails of water disturbances left behind by swimming prey. Museums collaborate for shared sample access and they create a worldwide network of sample distribution for researchers. Though these museums can be thousands of miles away from each other and some samples are too fragile or precious to send out on loan. But, as the digital revolution has rocked the boat and changed the way we do nearly everything, it has also helped the way we interact with museum collections. When you visit the American Museum of Natural History in New York, for example, you might see this. 
But behind the scenes, we might be looking at a specimen with this. In the microscopy and imaging facility, samples are CT scanned to create high-resolution digital models of their structure that le even let you look inside of it. Like the CT scan of an American alligator head scanned by Dr. Janak here, where you can see the exquisite surface detail on the head, but also look inside to see the skull and even image the brain. Other researchers are using laser scanners or other types of technology to create their 3D models. Like at the Field Museum, where they used a video game Kinect to be able to create a 3D model of their T-Rex, Sue. From this, they can even 3D print copies of the skull. This type of technology can make a 65 million year old fossil come alive. Thought leaders in museum science and research are making a massive push to digitize their collections. In 2009, the Smithsonian Digitization Program Office was launched with the ultimate goal of providing digital access to all of its museum collections. They digitize specimens and they make them freely available online in an effort to democratize this knowledge. Information that was once only available to experts is now open to everyone. Museums are a goldmine of design inspiration. By investing in the time and the equipment to digitize their specimens, they are setting the stage to become innovation hubs for bioinspired technology. And the best way to get there is through true cross-disciplinary collaboration. Because on the bio side and the engineering side, we see things a little bit differently. Biologists prioritize evolutionary organization, so collections of objects in museums are going to be organized by the way they're related to each other in this evolutionary tree of life pattern. Engineers, however, care mostly about the function of the ultimate design, and organisms that are not related may have arrived at a similar design solution. This is called convergent evolution, where organisms have gotten there through different evolutionary pathways. Flight, for example, has evolved at least four different times. Both ways of looking at things can help us unlock the design potential offered by biodiversity. By searching the evolutionary pathways, we can understand the context for a feature and look for variations in it. I study how the small bumps on seals' whiskers help them feel information from the water. Now, the harbor seal has always been used as the classic study example for this kind of research, but there are many different types of seals and we see a diversity of whisker, whisker types within the small group, as you can see in my Brady Bunch slide here. Looking across this group helps me understand how small variations in form could influence function. With functional search, on the other hand, you can search broadly across nature for answers to big questions. This is gonna break you from the one solution to one problem model and help you search for broad solutions for questions like how do things hover, climb, make the color blue. This was introduced in an iconic TED Talk by Janine Benyus that pushed us to ask nature for big solutions to problems. So, how do we do both? How do we swing from the branches of this evolutionary tree while still seeing the details of the leaves along the way? We don't know yet. But as a researcher in this field, I can tell you this conversation is starting. In 2016, the National Science Foundation hosted the Smithsonian and, the, and Virginia Tech to be able to have this conversation, um, and to be able to have this conversation in a workshop called Biological Collections as a Resource for Technical Innovation. The Smithsonian invited engineers behind the scenes to show them what the collections have to offer. And researchers who already collaborate closely with museums shared their success stories. Like researchers at UC Berkeley, who work with their Campus Natural History Museum to look at the toe pads on different species of geckos, helping them to create a robot that could walk up walls. Or researchers from Virginia Tech, who were able to work with Smithsonian samples of a diving seabird to understand how its flexible neck protects it while diving into the water. From this, they can try and understand how you can design equipment that can be dropped from an aircraft into the ocean without breaking. From this workshop, we developed a think tank to try and make these successes broader for the bio-inspired community. Our goal was to combine diverse researchers and guide solutions for future research potential, or essentially, lock a biologist, some engineers, an architect, economists, and data scientists into a room, slide some coffee under the door, and see if we can change the field. This think big and think together 
way of looking at things is what will help us direct the modern role of natural history museums and bioinspired technology. Huge advances in technology have already helped us do things we never thought would be possible. And now looking forward, a collaborative approach can help us rethink the way we catalog, scan, search, and organize this increasingly rich collection of information. Museums are essential to bring biodiversity to bioinspiration, but we need to acknowledge the value of that biodiversity. Because the exquisite design bank offered by life on this planet is rapidly diminishing. With habitat destruction, overexploitation, climate change, and overpopulation, we are losing species at an alarming rate. So if protecting the planet's biodiversity for its own right isn't enough, then think of it this way. Every minute, forests full of medicines, oceans full of technology, and deserts full of energy innovations are disappearing. We need to start looking at these organisms as technological partners that we value and protect. Thank you.